So I know that this is an audience that uh, knows exactly what ekphrasis is. Um, I'm someone who has been writing ekphrastic poems in many ways for a long time, um, not just uh, in the traditional sense, poems that respond to paintings, um, but also poems that respond to other works of art, um, photographs, um, statues, um, literature. And so I thought, um, just as an introduction, I would read the title poem of my second collection, Belloxophilia, because I began writing this poem after seeing for the first time a photograph by E.J. Belloc, who took photographs of women in the red light district, Storyville, New Orleans, uh, around the turn of the 20th century, 1911 or so. When I first saw one of his photographs, I was struck by how much the photograph looked like a painting that I had seen, the painting by John Everett Millay of Ophelia, which had been on the cover of my ninth grade Hamlet text. So in this poem, there's a lot of ekphrasis going on. It's not just the response to Millay's painting, but also to Belloc's photograph, and also to um, Hamlet and Ophelia. Belloc's Ophelia from a photograph circa 1912. In Millay's painting, Ophelia dies face up, eyes and mouth open as if caught in the gasp of her last word or breath, flowers and reeds growing out of the pond, floating on the surface around her. The young woman who posed lay in a bath for hours, shivering, catching cold, perhaps imagining fish tangling in her hair or nibbling a dark mole raised upon her white skin. Ophelia's final gaze aims skyward, her palms curling open as if she just said, take me. I think of her when I see Belloc's photograph, a woman posed on a wicker divan, her hair spilling over. Around her, flowers, on a pillow, on a thick carpet, even the ravages of this old photograph bloom like water lilies across her thigh. How long did she hold there, this other Ophelia, nameless inmate in Storyville, naked, her nipples offered up hard with cold? The small mound of her belly, the pale hair of her pubis, these things, her body, there for the taking. But in her face, a dare. Staring into the camera, she seems to pull all movement from her slender limbs and hold it in her heavy, lidded eyes. Her body limp as dead Ophelia's, her lips poised to open, to speak. I like the um, inherent pun of get thee to a nunnery that that poem enacts. One of the things um, that, that some of you out there will remember uh, a colleague we had named Dan Albergati, uh, who's now at Coastal Carolina. Um, it was thanks to Dan that I changed something very unfortunate in that poem. Um, when I first uh, wrote the poem, I was mistaken about how the woman who actually posed for Malay got pneumonia. I thought that she had actually posed by lying in that pond, but indeed it was um, in a bathtub and the... Uh, the little uh, candle went out underneath it, and that's how it happened. So originally, I had her actually in the pond, as opposed to imagining herself in the pond. And the poem was published like that. I won't say where, because um, you would hope the editors would help you with that. But I got to correct it for the book. So tonight, I'm going to read mostly from poems that are uh, coming out in the fall in my new book. There are a lot more ekphrastic poems in this book than um, any of my others, even as Belloc's Ophelia was primarily based on the photographs of E.J. Belloc. There are a lot more poems about paintings in this book and a few poems about photographs as well. And a few poems that even respond, uh, not quite ekphrastically, um, but to documents and documentary evidence. 
When I was finishing up my last book, Native Guard, I was doing one of the things that I always do, which is to look up in the dictionary words that I think I know, uh, to see what I've forgotten uh, in those secondary and tertiary and on and on definitions that might lead to a deepening of the figurative level of the poem. And I was very surprised when I looked up the word native to find that it did not mean what I had expected, uh, someone who is a native of Alabama or a native plant. Um, instead, the word native, the first definition that comes up is someone born into the condition of servitude, a thrall. And so, needless to say, I was enthralled by that idea, the idea that when we go there to colonize those people, that they are the thralls, they are the natives. This is a, a book that I think is um, difficult in a lot of ways because it is interested in thraldom in its many facets, particularly the ways that we are enthralled to certain things, um, like language or law. So for example, when I was born in the 60s in Mississippi, um, it was still illegal in the state constitution for my parents to get married, an interracial marriage. And so we were indeed enthralled to the laws of Mississippi and many other states, including the great state of Alabama. Um, and, you know, we, we were also enthralled to the language of such documents, the language, the taxonomies that created a whole language for mixed race people and the, elite, the um, illegitimacy of children born in that way. And so um, I know most of you will remember that only about 12 or so years ago now did Alabama vote to get rid of the anti-miscegenation laws for the, from the books. So even as they went away, about 40-some percent of the population had, had voted for, to keep them so that at least symbolically it could be said that parents like mine couldn't be married legally and people like me born legally in the state. That for me is a sense of being in enthralled to language and being enthralled to certain customs. I'm also interested in how we are enthralled by certain things, by beauty, by a landscape, by art, um, by our calling to be artists, for example. And so the book also investigates those kinds of things. It investigates the kind of apprenticeship that an artist or a writer might undertake. Um, and for me, that's particularly uh, uh, heavy because my father is also a poet. It is also in many ways about uh, empire and the, the language and the knowledge of empire and the thraldom that empire holds us in and of course the empire of the father. Scott asked me if I was going to have um, images and I, and I declined because I, I'm hoping that of course the poems themselves give you the kinds of images and help you see the painting even as I'm asking you to see other things in the painting. But I would encourage you to go look some of these up because they're fascinating paintings, particularly um, the paintings that depict the miracle of the black leg. I'm wondering if you, any of you even know about the miracle of the black leg and these, there are so many of these paintings. Uh, Saints Cosmas and Damien, the patron saints of medicine. So Saints Cosmas and Damien, the, the, the myth of the miracle transplant, um, a white recipient, black donor, goes back to about the 13th century in um, written versions. Uh, pictorial versions appeared a little bit later, but they depict them in altarpieces and illuminations, and they depict the miracle in several countries, um, just as these poems and narratives uh, record it in many different languages. Some of the countries that you might find it in, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Portugal, Switzerland, France, and Belgium, two of the Miracle of the Black, pain, uh, black Leg paintings are actually here in the United States. One of them is at uh, the Yale Gallery of Art, and the other is at uh, the museum in, at Chapel Hill. Miracle of the Black Leg. One, always the dark body hewn asunder. Always one man is healed, his sick limb replaced, placed in another man's grave. The white leg buried beside the corpse or attached as if it were always there. 
If not for the dark appendage, you might miss the story beneath this story, what remains each time the myth changes, how, in one version, the doctors harvest the leg from a man four days dead in his tomb at the church of a martyr, or, in another, desecrate a body fresh in the graveyard at St. Peter in chains. There was buried just today an Ethiopian. Even now, it stays with us. When we mean to uncover the truth, we dig, say, unearth. Two, emblematic in paint, a signifier of the body's lacuna, the black leg is at once a grafted narrative, a redacted line of text, and in this scene, a dark stocking pulled above the knee. Here, the patient is sleeping, his head at rest in his hand. Beatific, he looks as if he'll wake from a dream. On the floor, beside the bed, a dead moor. Hands crossed at the groin, the swapped limb white and rotting, fused in place. And in the corner, a question, poised as if to speak the syntax of sloughing a snake's curved form. It emerges from the mouth of a boy like a tongue, slippery and rooted in the body as knowledge. For centuries, this is how the myth repeats. The miracle in words or wood or paint is a record of thought. Three. See how the story changes. In one painting, the Ethiop is merely a body, featureless in a coffin so black he has no face. In another, the patient at the top of the frame seems to writhe in pain, the black leg grafted to his thigh. Below him, a mirror of suffering, the blackamoor, his body a fragment arched across the doctor's lap as if dying from his wound. If not imminence, the soul's bright anchor, blood passed from one to the other, what knowledge haunts each body, what history, what phantom ache? One man always low, in a grave or on the ground, the other up high, closer to heaven. One man always diseased, the other a body in service, plundered. Four. Both men are alive in Violdo's carving. In twinned relief, they hold the same posture, the same pained face, each man reaching to touch his left leg. The black man on the floor holds his stump. Above him, the doctor restrains the patient's arm as if to prevent him touching the dark amendment of flesh. How not to see it, the men bound one to the other, symbiotic, one man rendered expendable, the other worthy of this sacrifice. Inversion after version, even when the Ethiopian isn't there, the leg is a stand-in a black modifier against the white body, a piece cut off, as in the origin of the word comma, sejura in a story that's still being written. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I have to say about that, and I, I am endlessly in, in in Auburn University's debt is um, that when I started working on this book, I began by looking at some, some paintings that I'm going to read to you about next, but they led me to start thinking about the ways that hybridity or hybrid bodies would be represented in art um, across time and space. And I started looking around, and I didn't know how to find these kinds of paintings. Um, but it occurred to me that maybe um, I would find them um, in, in, mo in, you know, from, from in the history of uh, ideas about blood and blood purity. And so that, of course, led me to conflicts over religion as well as race. And I was sitting in my office one day, and, and there was this book on the shelf. Um, it, it was called um, the, the, I, the Art of the Renaissance, and it just so happened to be a text that we faculty were assigned to read in our preparations for teaching a great books course. 
And so there it was, and I pulled it off the shelf, and there was actually a section called Race in the Renaissance. And the first image I saw was one of these Miracle of the Black Leg paintings. And so there was the, the white body of, of, the, of the diseased man who had had the cancerous leg, um, and it had this crazy black leg attached to it. And the leg of the, um, the white man's leg that had been removed, amputated, was lying on the ground next to it. Or, and as I began to look at more of these paintings, the leg, you would see it in the grave. Like they would take it back and put it in the grave of the black man because there was still an idea that in order for a soul to ascend to heaven, the body had to be intact. So they would put the leg back. And then when they didn't care about that anymore, you didn't see the leg going back. But it was fascinating to think about whose body was being healed and whose body, alive or dead, was being desecrated. And I loved coming up with that strange little thing that happened, of course, because of reading the dictionary, that in the original Greek, comma meant a piece cut off, like that little black leg hanging there. This is after a series of Costa paintings by Juan Rodriguez Suarez, circa 1715. And the Costa paintings in colonial Mexico represented the mixed blood unions that were taking place in the colony and the offspring of those unions. What was interesting to me about those paintings is that you saw right on the painting not only the mother and father and the child that they would have created, but also uh, the language, the taxonomy that was created to name them right on the painting. So, de Espanol y de India produce mestizo, for example. One of the other things that was interesting to me about uh, colonial Mexico and that particular history is that there was still a belief there, as in many places, that um, indigenous blood, after a few generations of intermixing, could be whitened to purity or purified to whiteness, a kind of blood alchemy, but that the taint of African blood was irreversible. And so you had names like mulatto returning backwards, I don't understand you, or hold yourself in midair. Um, when you were born, if you were a mixed race person, your name was recorded in the book of Costas, the book of mixed blood people, and there you stayed and were, and, and were in thrall, of course, to your social standing based on your blood impurity. Taxonomy. One, de Espanol y de India produce mestizo. The canvas is a leaden sky behind them, heavy with words, gold letters inscribing an equation of blood. This plus this equals this, as if a contract with nature, or a museum label, ethnographic, precise. See how the father's hand beneath its crown of lace curls around his daughter's head. She's nearly fair as he is, Calidad. See it in the brooch at her collar, the lace framing her face. An infant, she is born over the servant's left shoulder, bound to him by a sling, the plain blue cloth knotted at his throat. If the father, his hand on her skull, divines as the physiognomist does the mysteries of her character, discursive, legible on her light flesh, in the soft curl of her hair, we cannot know it, so gentle the eye he turns toward her. The mother, glancing sideways toward him, the scarf on her head, white as his face, his powdered wig, gestures with one hand a shape like the letter C. C, she seems to say, what we have made. The servant, still a child, cranes his neck, turns his face up toward all of them. He is dark as history, origin of the word native the weight of blood, a pale mistress on his back, heavier every year. Two, de Espanol y Negra produce mulatto. Still, the centuries have not dulled the sullenness of the child's expression. If there is light inside him, it does not shine through the paint that holds his face in profile, his domed forehead, eyes nearly closed beneath a heavy brow. Though inside, the boy's father stands in his cloak and hat, it's as if he's just come in or that he's leaving. 
We see him transient, rolling a cigarette, myopic, his eyelids drawn against the child passing before him. At the stove, the boy's mother contorts, watchful, her neck twisting on its spine, red beads yoked at her throat like a necklace of blood, her face so black she nearly disappears into the canvas, the dark wall upon which we see the words that name them. What should we make of any of this? Remove the words above their heads, put something else in place of the child, a table perhaps, upon which the man might set his hat, or a dog upon which to bestow the blessing of his touch, and the story changes. The boy is a palimpsest of paint, layers of color, history rendering him that precise shade of in-between. Before this, he was nothing, blank canvas, before image or word, before a last brushstroke fixed him in his place. Three, the Espanol y Mestiza produce Castiza. How not to see in this gesture the mind of the colony? In the mother's arms, the child hinged at her womb, dark cradle of mixed blood, call it Mexico, turns toward the father reaching to him as if back to Spain, to the promise of blood alchemy, three easy steps to purity. From a Spaniard and an Indian, a mestizo. From a mestizo and a Spaniard, a castizo. From a castizo and a Spaniard, a Spaniard. We see her here, one generation away, nearly slipping, her mother's careful grip. Four, the Book of Castas. Call it the catalog of mixed bloods, or the Book of Not, not Spaniard, not white, but mulatto returning backwards, or hold yourself in midair, and the Morisca, the Lobo, the Chino, Sambo, Albino, and the No Te Entiendo, the I Don't Understand You. Guidebook to the colony, record of each crossed birth, it is the typology of taint, of stain, blemish, sullying spot, that which can be purified, that which cannot, Canaan's black fate, how like a dirty joke it seems. What do you call that space between the dark geographies of sex? Call it the taint, as in it taint one and it taint the other illicit and yet naming still what is between. Between her parents, the child, mulatto returning backwards, cannot slip their hold, the triptych their bodies make, in paint, in blood, her name, written down in the book of castas, all her kind in thrall to a word. This may be um, about a painting that some of you will recognize. Two versions of it. Um, this one is after, it's uh, Diego Velasquez, circa 1619, kitchen maid with supper at Emmaus, or the mulatta. There's also uh, the uh, kitchen maid without the supper at Emmaus going on in the background. But if you've seen it, you know she's there cleaning and in the background. Uh, there's that image in a frame is it a painting or is it indeed um, actually happening through a window? Kitchen maid with supper at Emmaus or the mulatta. She is the vessels on the table before her. The copper pot tipped toward us, the white pitcher clutched in her hand, the black one edged in red and upside down. Bent over, she is the mortar and the pestle at rest in the mortar, still angled in its posture of use. She is the stack of bowls and the bulb of garlic beside it, the basket hung by a nail on the wall and the white cloth bundled in it, the rag in the foreground recalling her hand. She's the stain on the wall, the size of her shadow, the color of blood, the shape of a thumb. 
She is echo of Jesus at table, framed in the scene behind her, his white corona, her white cap. Listening, she leans into what she knows. Light falls on half her face. This next poem is um, after a chalk drawing by J. H. Hasselhorst, 1864. Knowledge. Whoever she was, she comes to us like this. Lips parted, long hair spilling from the table like water from a pitcher, nipples drawn out for inspection. Perhaps to foreshadow the object she'll become, a skeleton on a pedestal, a row of skulls on a shelf. To make a study of the ideal female body, four men gather around her. She is young and beautiful and drowned, a Venus de Medici risen from the sea, sleeping. As if we could mistake this work for sacrilege, the artist entombs her body in a pyramid of light, a temple of science over which the anatomist presides. In the service of beauty, to know it, he lifts a flap of skin beneath her breast as one might draw back a sheet. We will not see his step-by-step -step parsing, a translation, Mary or Catherine or Elizabeth, to corpus, areola, vulva. In his hands, instruments of the empirical, scalpel, pincers, cold as the room must be cold, all the men in coats trimmed in velvet or fur, soft as the down of her pubis. Now one man is smoking, another tilts his head to get a better look. Yet another at the head of the table peers down as if enthralled, his fist on a stack of books. In the drawing, this is only the first cut, a delicate wounding, and yet how easily the anatomist's blade opens a place in me, like a curtain drawn upon a room in which each learned man is my father. And I hear again his words. I study my crossbreed child. Misnomer and taxonomy, the language of zoology. Here he is all of them, the preoccupied man, an artist, collector of experience, the skeptic angling his head, his thoughts tilting toward what I cannot know the marshaller of knowledge, knuckling down a stack of books, even the dissector, his scalpel in hand like a pen poised above me, aimed straight for my heart. Thank you. So I have been trying to deal with ideas about knowledge um, and the knowledge of empire, um, empire's blindnesses about knowledge sometimes. The book actually has two epigraphs, and I should mention one of them particularly because um, Scott is putting up that lovely Audubon exhibit. I remember falling in love with um, Robert Penn Warren's uh, poem um, about Audubon. And this is a, a couple of lines from one of the sections about considering sort of Audubon and his need to um, kill the, the birds that he drew in order to, to really make them seem lifelike. So the first uh, epigraph I use is from Robert Penn Warren and the second that seems to answer it for me is from T.S. Eliot. What is love? One name for it is knowledge. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? This is another one of the Costa paintings. Um, Diel Baña y Español Nes Torna Atras, which is from albino and Spaniard, a return backwards is born. 
This is circa 1785 to 1790, and it's by an anonymous painter, Torna Atras. The unknown artist has rendered the father a painter, and so we see him at his work, painting a portrait of his wife, their dark child watching nearby, a servant grinding colors in the corner. The woman poses just beyond his canvas and cannot see her likeness, her less than mirror image coming to life beneath his hand. He has rendered her homely, so unlike the woman we see in this scene, dressed in late century fashion, a chicador, mark of beauty in the shape of a crescent moon affixed to her temple. If I say his painting is unfinished, that he has yet to make her beautiful, to match the elegant sweep of her hair, the graceful tilt of her head, has yet to adorn her dress with lace and trim, it is only one way to see it. You might see instead that the artist, perhaps to show his own skill, has made the father a dilettante, incapable of capturing his wife's beauty or that he cannot see it, his mind's eye reducing her to what he's made, as if to reveal the illusion imminent in her flesh. If you consider the century's mythology of the body, that a dark spot marked the genitals of anyone with African blood, you might see how the black moon on her white face recalls it, the Rosita she passes to her child, marking him Torna Atras. If I tell you such terms were born in the Enlightenment's hallowed rooms that the wages of empire is myopia, you might see the father's vision as desire embodied in paint. This rendering of his wife, born of need to see himself as architect of truth, benevolent patriarch, father of uplift, ordering his domain. And you might see why, to understand my father, I look again and again at this painting, how it is that a man could love and so diminish what he loves. I'm just going to read a couple more now um, to finish up. Another famous painting um, that you might know, and one not so famous, but um, Velasquez painted uh, a portrait of Juan de Pereja. Juan de Pereja was his slave, a mulatto slave, and a worker in his studio. And he took him to Rome. Um, to practice for a painting that he was, that Velasquez was going to make of Pope Innocent X. Um, and so he uh, made this portrait of his slave in order to prepare. And it's one of uh, a very famous painting uh, that people have commented on just how um, real and human um, Juan de Pereja seems in this painting. Juan de Pereja was a painter himself. Um, and once he was free, um, and a few years after or a year after Velasquez was dead, he painted what is his most famous painting, The Calling of St. Matthew. So this is a persona poem in the voice of Juan de Pereja in 1670, a few years before his death. And it very much is about um, the calling um, to be an artist, about apprenticeship. Thrall. He was not my father, though he might have been. I came to him the mulatto son of a slave woman, just that, as if it took only my mother to make me a mulatto, meaning any white man could be my father. In his shop, bound to the muller, I ground his colors, my hands dusted black with fired bone, stained blue and flecked with glass, my nails edged vermilion as if my fingertips bled. In this way, just as I turned the pages of his books, I meant to touch everything he did. 
With Velasquez in Rome, a divination. At market, I lingered to touch the bright hulls of lemons, closed my eyes until the scent was oil and thinner, yellow ochre in my head. And once, the sudden taste of iron, a glimpse of red like a wound opening, the robes of the Pope at portrait, that bright shade of blood before it darkens, purpling nearly to black. Because he said painting was not labor, was the province of free men, I could only watch. Such beauty in the work of his hands, his quick strokes, a divine language I learned over his shoulder my own hands tracing the air in his wake. Forbidden to answer in paint, I kept my canvases secret, hidden until Velasquez decreed unto me myself. Free, I was apprentice, he my master still. How intently at times could he fix his keen eye upon me, though only once did he fix me in paint, my color a study, my eyes wide as I faced him, a lace collar at my shoulders as though I'd been born noble, the yoke of my birth gone from my neck. In his hand, a long brush to keep him far from the canvas, far from it as I was. The distance between us doubled that he could observe me twice, stand closer to what he made. For years, I looked to it as one looks into a mirror. And so, in the calling of St. Matthew, I painted my own likeness, a freeman in the house of customs waiting to pay my duty. In my hand, an answer, a slip of paper, my signature on it, Juan de Pereja, 1661, Velasquez, one year gone. Behind me, upright on a shelf, a forged platter, luminous as an aureole just beyond my head. My face turned to look out from the scene, a self-portrait. To make it, I looked at how my master saw me. Then I narrowed my eyes. Now, at the bright edge of sleep, mother. She comes back to me as sound, her voice in the echo of bird call, a single syllable, again and again my name, one, 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 or a bit of song that, waking, I cannot grasp. So two last poems then. Um, my father many years ago, I think just when I was out of college, took me to Monticello for the first time. And, um, you know, that sort of underscores a debate that my father, father and I have been having for years, some of which you will hear come up in, in the poem. Um, and so because of this debate, I wickedly, uh, once Annette Gordon-Reed started publishing her brilliant research, I started sending each Christmas my father these books about Jefferson and the Hemingses. Um, this is a way a daughter gets back at her father. Um, and recently, when I was trying to finish this book, I said, you know, I know that if I can take my father back to Monticello, I'll be able to finish it. There will be a poem in this. And of course, since we're both poets, there's a race to see who was going to get the poem first. Last time I talked to him, he was struggling. Um, mine's done. And uh, so maybe I get at least the first word, if not the last word. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting about going to Monticello 20 years later is that um, now the, the, the official narrative, part of Monticello's narrative, you know, that historians have agreed to and adopted and that the docent will tell you is that it is um, believed and, you know, uh, that Jefferson indeed fathered uh, at least uh, one or two of Sally Hemings and Sally Hemings's children, perhaps more. And so this is a thing that was sort of, sort of not talked about, you know, before, and now it's actually part of the official narrative of the site. And so this is the first thing that happened, you know, when my father and I went there, you walk in and, and you get the official story. This is called Enlightenment. In the portrait of Jefferson that hangs at Monticello, he is rendered two-toned, his forehead white with illumination, a lit bulb, the rest of his face in shadow, darkened as if the artist meant to contrast his bright knowledge, its dark subtext. 
By 1805, when Jefferson sat for the portrait, he was already linked to an affair with his slave. Against a backdrop blue and ethereal, a wash of paint that seems to hold him in relief, Jefferson gazes out across the centuries, his lips fixed as if he's just uttered some final word. The first time I saw the painting, I listened as my father explained the contradictions, how Jefferson hated slavery, though out of necessity, my father said, had to own slaves. That his moral philosophy meant he could not have fathered those children, would have been impossible, my father said. For years, we debated the distance between word and deed. I'd follow my father from book to book, gathering citations, listening as he named, like a field guide to Virginia, each flower and tree and bird, as if to prove a man's pursuit of knowledge is greater than his shortcomings, the limits of his vision. I did not know then the subtext of our story, that my father could imagine Jefferson's words made flesh in my flesh, the improvement of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites, or that my father could believe he'd made me better. When I think of this now, I see how the past holds us captive, its beautiful ruin etched on the mind's eye, my young father, a rough outline of the old man he's become, needing to show me the better measure of his heart, an equation writ large at Monticello. That was years ago. Now we take in how much has changed. Talk of Sally Hemings, someone asking how white was she, parsing the fractions as if to name what made her worthy of Jefferson's attentions, a near white, quadroon mistress, not a plain black slave. Imagine stepping back into the past, our guide tells us, and I can't resist whispering to my father, this is where we split up. I'll head around to the back. When he laughs, I know he's grateful I've made a joke of it, this history that links us, white father, black daughter, even as it renders us other to each other. And I'm going to finish now with the opening poem of the book. Not a particularly ekphrastic poem, but it is a poem that um, responds to a couple of others out there. Elegy for my father. I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. Late August, I imagine it as it was that morning. Drizzle needling the surface, mist at the banks like a net settling around us. Everything damp and shining. That morning, awkward and heavy in our hip waders, we stalked into the current and found our places. You upstream a few yards and out far deeper. You must remember how the river seeped in over your boots and you grew heavier with that defeat. All day, I kept turning to watch you, how first you mimed our guide's casting, then cast your invisible line, slicing the sky between us. And later, rod in hand, how you tried again and again to find that perfect arc, flight of an insect skimming the river's surface. Perhaps you recall I cast my line and reeled in two small trout we could not keep. Because I had to release them, I confess, I thought about the past, working the hooks loose, the fish writhing in my hands, each one slipping away before I could let go. I can tell you now that I tried to take it all in, record it for an elegy I'd write one day when the time came. Your daughter, I was that ruthless. What does it matter if I tell you I learned to be? You kept casting your line, and when it did not come back empty, it was tangled with mine. Some nights, dreaming, I step again into the small boat that carried us out and watch the bank receding. 
my back to where I know we are headed.